All right, I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm going to push the button. I'm ready. Can you hear me? We are here, ladies and gentlemen, with Matt Copeland, Profile Racing, lifelong BMX rider, and also participant in the uh, hardcore music scene. Am I saying that correctly? Like, is that what people <laughs> actually call it? Uh, maybe not participant, but... <laughs> member? I, 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 I don't know about member. Just uh, of interest, of interest in the NEO. Okay. So, so where this all came from is I was in the shower where all of my great ideas come to me. <laughs> and I, like, was thinking about the hardcore scene, whatever it's technically called. And, and I was thinking about how it's, like, seems to be, like, a family and how there's, like, values that people seem to hold and, and different groups of people who might have different values and all of these different things. I'm like, wow, like, it feels oddly similar to BMX and how we have a scene and a family and some values that we tend to hold closely. And the first person I thought of that I wanted to talk to about that was someone who I knew who was in a hardcore, do you call it hardcore band, punk band? Uh, yeah, I guess it was kind of a hardcore band. Yeah. So yeah. you were actually in a band that played that type of music with that type of culture. It, culture is the word I'm looking for. Sure. sure. Culture. <laughs> BMX culture, hardcore culture. I need to change the title to that. But <laughs> so, do you feel like there's similarities there, right off? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're for me. They're. Um, I mean, I found them tandemly. Actually, I found them about the same time uh, in the late '80s, uh, running into 1990. But I kind of found punk through the skate scene because I always had skater friends, and uh, I just happened to get into BMX, which was not what they did. I kind of did it alone, and then I rode with uh, a bunch of skaters, and through skate culture, I was introduced to the punk scene, essentially. So, And a lot of those skaters I actually are still close friends of mine, actually, that are still skating and still into the actually different types of music, but it's all kind of encompassed on an umbrella under an umbrella, which is, you know, punk so, and or hardcore. Good point, too, in that they're, in some places, they are, like, the same thing. They're intertwined. Yeah. Where Absolutely. I mean, here in Tampa, it, it was. I mean, it became the, the punk scene. The five main guys that I rode with when I first started riding, when I found, like, a scene, I should say, because I rode alone for about a year. And then when I found, like, the scene that was my first scene that I became a part of, they were all also with the punk so it was it, it was hand in hand it was the same thing essentially so interesting so that kind of makes it a really easy answer to my original <laughs> things like well they're the same thing so yeah i mean they were i mean they're not you know i'm sure it's different everywhere but it just so happened to be in tampa that the bmxers that i wrote the first were all also in the punk rock which was rad it's it's an interesting thing to think about and have you experienced the culture of punk and all that stuff outside of Tampa at all? To oh yeah, absolutely for sure. I mean, I've I've I made the connections uh, in the punk scene and BMX. Again, they were tandem, but I was reaching out and connecting with people that were in both of those scenes, but also people that I found out that were together in those scenes as well. I, I used to um, I used to write to a lot of people like pen pals. I was pen pals with a lot of people, like either, you know, through a BMX magazine, I would make contacts or through like a punk zine, I would make contacts. And, um, I mean, there was a point in high school where I was probably writing 20 to 25 letters a week. And then it actually, even it, it, it became, there was, I was writing more than that in college. I was probably writing honestly, probably 30 or 40 letters a week to people. It was insane. I don't know how I time to do it. Wow. But, um, a lot of the people that I, that I had made contacts with through the punk scene actually ended up being BMXers as well, all over the world. Like some of my BMX, one of my closest friends still is Alexi Deselnew from Paris. And um, I was writing to his buddy who ran a record label and we do record trading. And Alexi had stepped in to answer the record label's correspondence for the three weeks while this dude was on vacation. And then Alexi and I became pen pals for two years. And then in one of the letters I had mentioned that I was getting ready to go ride my buddy's mini ramp, and he's like, wait, you ride BMX? And I'm like, yeah, actually I do. And uh, I found out that he not only was a rider, but he was a super well-known rider in France. 
and, and still is. I mean, he he's one of the um, he's one of the head judges for the feast contest you know, on the flat wow. side. And um, my wife is good friends with him now. He comes to visit us. I mean, he hasn't visited in two years, but he's over here probably every every other year to visit. Um, my buddy Gervais in France and another rider over there, same, same deal. I met a lot of Canadian BMXers that way. Um, I want to go off on a tangent because that's kind of, <laughs> there's a lot of stories to tell going that route, but yeah, that's kind of how it started. Do you think that there's more people in that culture that ride or skate than there are who don't? Let me, let me reframe that question so I can digest that. So actually, I'm sorry, Brent, give that to me one more time. So the the punk hardcore yeah. culture, do you think yeah. there's more people that are involved with that who skate or ride that are in there that don't skate or ride? No, probably not. I mean, it's definitely, it's it's a minority, but, you know, just like with NBMX, you kind of hone in on those people. Um, there's, I mean, there's still quite a few. There's Rick McDonald, who's a flatlander from New England who ran a record label that I bought a ton of records from, did not know that he was a BMXer until years later. Um, I mean, Crandall was kind of at his own, his own kind of punk scene up in the Northeast that, um, you know, eventually moved to Richmond and he made a ton of contacts. Um, so, you no, know, going back to your question, it, it's still a minority, but there's still quite a lot of, of a crossover there. So Right. So, so with the people who don't ride or skate, what, have you noticed any like of the values that we talk about that are like intertwined, like what types of things are similar between them? Well, I mean, going back to the original um, parallel that you made with it being kind of this family, I mean, there, there's the, there's definitely a misfit aspect. I mean, I don't know if you experienced it in BMX. I definitely did. Like BMX was what I went to because I, I kind of just didn't fit in with anything. And punk was the same deal. Like I, I found this group of, of skaters that I really connected to and therefore the, the punk ethos kind of trickled from them into me. I mean, there's, I don't know how to, uh, I mean, there, there's parallels there even, you know, with, with the communication I've made with, with BMX or some of the years too, not to keep bringing up Crandall, but we're, we're tight and he and I have so many of the same ideals and so much of the same ethos that we're being again, paralleled within the BMX and the punk scene at the same time, it kind of meld, melded together. But I mean, there, there's the, there's the family idea. You mentioned that before. And there is, I mean, a lot of the punk, um, the, a lot of the, the people in Tampa that are still involved in the punk scene are still my extended family for the most part. I'm still in contact, contact with them. I'm still going to shows. I'm still communicating with them. I'm still doing projects with them. So, um, I would say above above and beyond, it's that familial connection that you've mentioned before, for sure. That that is definitely the the tie that binds, absolutely. Right, and I think that's kind of what made me make the connection in the first place. Yeah. So th that makes me wonder too, how, like, how many other types of like, do people who play chess feel like they're a family <laughs> the same way that people who that's ride? A good question. Yeah. I'm sure there's people who do, but then I'm sure there's also people who like just show up at the local chess spot. But at the same time, that's no different than us showing up at the skate park too. Sure. But I think, you know, there's that connection of it being this, this secret, secret subculture, you know, that was the one thing, like there's definitely more of a connection of you being in this like secret society of people in the know, like the, 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 the punk, the, the, the style of music that I would eventually get into later after being introduced to, you know, the general punk bands of that era, mm -hmm. you know, definitely like this, this society of, of, of women and, and men and within the punk scene who, who had the connection within that very specific type of music that was DIY, which is another aspect, actually, speaking of the familial aspect, there's this DIY component too. That's a part of the punk scene that is so very much brain BMX as well. So there's that aspect as well. But um, I digress again. I'm sorry. Your question. Was... You can keep <laughs> all of the tangents. That's the whole point of this conversation is to just explore the similarities between these two very different, but somewhat similar things. Sure. It, it's so interesting to me. And I was going to ask at some point too how the the straight edge thing fits in with all of this because I know that, or at least I've heard that that's like 
part of some of the punk type of things. There's, there's, there's maybe that's its own culture too. Yeah, I mean, the straight edge ideal is is definitely a part of the punk scene. It is a it is a subgenre of punk, which is actually it's a subgenre of hardcore, which was a subgenre of punk. But anyways, it, there, there's that straight edge component as well. It was really big in Tampa when um, when when I was in college. There was a huge, huge straight edge scene here, and, and I'm I was part of it then. I'm still part of it now. I'm, I still consider myself straight edge. I have been. I mean, I've never done anything, so I've been straight in that aspect for my whole life. But the straight edge component, like, I kind of started considering myself straight edge, actually, in, like, 91 when I had figured out that there was kind of a label to throw on that. Not to toss labels, but that's kind of just what I connected with. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, straight edge is a subgenre of the punk scene, for sure. So, And there's also that, again, familial component. There's a DIY component there's a BMX component in that as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I feel like there's a lot of people in BMX, and, and maybe it was something that's kind of gained and gone through the the waves as far as, like, how popular, I guess you could call it. I know that's not what you'd want to use for that term, but it definitely is just like anything else. Is like it became cool, and then it wasn't cool, mm-hmm. and... And I don't, I'm wondering if, if it was one of those things, it was just the fact that people rode were also straight edge or, sure. did, or are they, they intertwined somehow? A mm-hmm. uh, funny thing too, the, the, the original group of riders that I rode with were also all straight edge too, which was kind of odd. <laughs> it was, they were, you know, BMXers that were into punk that were also all straight edge. So wild and not just going to strengthen the family ties yeah. for all of that Absolutely. And, and granted i mean a lot of uh a lot of those riders have gone on to do other things but we are all still really close friends like all of those all of those riders are you know i mean they they don't ride so much anymore but i still have a connection to them we still hang out we still get together it's great so it's it's a really cool thing to talk about and and it feels like it's just the another thing that brings people together the same way bmx does and it's also an, another way for people who ride and are friends to hang out outside of riding yeah. i'm sure you have just like i do the people that you hang out with outside of riding but that you do ride with and sure. then people who you just you only ever ride with them or you only go to the shows with them or whatever it might sure. be absolutely i mean it also helps me too i've been like the older i get the more kind of not reclusive by any means because I do still ride a lot. And, um, again, I still go to shows, but like outside of those two, um, things that I do, I'm kind of, I, I don't do much of anything else actually. I mean, I, sorry, I take that back. I, every, everything else I do is kind of on solo terms. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know, I mean, uh, reading or writing or, or doing something on my own. So, the, you know, the BMX side and the, the, the social aspect of the punk scene are the two things that I do, you know, in tandem but with different groups of people so it's super interesting i wonder if there'll ever be another like scene culture whatever you want to call it that overlaps as much as these two do because you're not gonna have country music and bmx (laughs) riders combining (laughs) the same way and it's i i don't know has it ever happened before or will ever happen again i wonder sure sure and I don't, I'm guessing that's probably because so many of the people who did one also, like, rode were also involved with that. It's mm. such an interesting thing. I had a question in the chat um, from somebody whose username, I don't know if you'd recognize this or not, but it's uh, Love Machine BMX 54 He said, is Significant Records still around in Tampa? Oh, that's really funny. No, Significant. Wait, Significant? Um... Did Tom, does Tom do significant records? No. Uh, oh, let me look that up. Maybe he that, knows. <laughs> if it's if it's Tom, then yeah, I actually just saw Tom Friday night. Um, let me look this up real quick. Yeah, no problem. It's, it's interesting. There's another guy, DFLJ, who said, My life since basically 11 has been BMX, punk slash HC, and metal. 
When I was 13, I started playing music and left my last band at age 28. It's a lifestyle on both sides and family too. Tight music scenes are just as tight as tight BMX scenes. Yeah, true. That's, there's no, no getting around that. I mean, a band of people feels like they're probably similar to the same f four dudes who ride together every single yeah, day. Yeah. Yeah. Significance is it's Tom. So Tom is still around. He's still out of Tampa. He actually just put on a show. Uh, he put on a Prince midnight show actually last Friday. Um, uh, no, it's in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I think that's Tom. Regardless, yeah, I think it was still out, out of Tampa. So, to answer that question, sorry. No problem. So, man, I just had a really good question that just lost, went right out of it. It came in and just left. <laughs> uh, damn it. Jeff Mead, what's up, man? Um, I'm trying to think of other parallels between these things because they definitely exist. Well, I mean, one thing that I had I had actually taken notes today, and, and the one interesting thing on the on the BMX side of things is the early video influences on that music scene, or not influences on that scene. The the influences that you know, punk. I mean, punk is so nebulous almost; it's it encompasses so much. I was going through like like the four or five most influential videos for me, and yeah. talk like actual VHS videos. Sorry mm -hmm. to go back that far but like you know i had i made a list of, of head first and right on and clowns full of hate and then i was i hit up jeff c about don't quit your day job because i actually didn't realize that uh bob and he did it together but the soundtrack for don't quit your day job i was talking to jeff about this yesterday and it was like some of those songs were very specific punk bands that were very they were they're really obscure so when I had seen that video, I'm like, wait a minute, there's BMXers out there that, that are in tune with this really obscure punk rock that I'm into. And I had met Bob um, right around that time as well. So there's that really interesting connection there as well. Uh, but going back to Head First and Clowns Full of Hate and Ride On, like there was Discord Records, which is out of DC. Um, you've probably heard of a lot of the bands that were on Discord, such as Mind Threat. I mean, that was probably the most well-known band on that record label, uh, which were a huge influence on on punk and, and, and hardcore. Um, Ride On and Head First had a ton of Discord bands, mainly Fugazi, which one of the uh, one of the guys from um, Minor Threat and um, and Guy Picciato, who was in A Rights of Spring, was also a Discord band, formed Fugazi, and they became highly influential. But that was a really big deal band for me as well uh, of that era. And, and those videos really pushed those bands. And the most iconic writing and iconic video parts were to those bands' music as well. So like Hoffman and Rick Thorne for sure. Um, and DMC actually as well. Dennis McCoy, those guys like were also into punk. Um, and they were into some of the more obscure punk which was really, really awesome to see in those videos. So again, like, even though I was, I was introduced at the same time to that music, I almost at the time just thought that's what BMX was. I'm like, oh, this is the music that, that this is the soundtrack to BMX. <laughs> so. That's what I was just going to bring up. So maybe the connection and why it's so strong and why there's so many people in such an overlap is because of those things. So people are watching those videos and they hear that music and then they're like, oh, this is cool because this is part of what I like and why I love watching these videos. All right, I'm going to go explore the bands now. Now I'm going to go sure. watch the bands. Now I meet all these people. Oh, cool. They ride BMX too. Now we're all part of this gigantic group. Yeah, absolutely. Which is yeah, so, so it's funny. I, I honestly I don't know why I didn't think of that. Of course, those I mean those icons of BMX culture, you know, were uh, it's pretty amazing actually. I mean, even going back to my buddy uh, Henry Wilson, who he and I are, are closer in age, he's a couple of years older than me, but he he shows me. I didn't start riding until '89, but he he also sends me a lot of videos from the AFA days. And I was watching actually an AFA video of Rick Thorne the other day, and he's riding a government issue, which is another Discord band from that era. But there was a really influential uh, flatland rider from here, um, and uh, one of his sections was to, I think it was, I think it was Gorilla Biscuits at the time, which is another very influential hardcore band. But I remember looking back on that too and seeing that, and like, God, these dudes were like these obscure 
writers were also into this really obscure music at the time that I didn't connect to until until much later on. But uh, anyway, side note. That's um, just cool. Yeah, going through those videos, there, there was definitely a connection there. There was also, like, it was a huge industrial scene out of Chicago as well, and industrial music is like, I don't know how to explain it, it's like post-punk mixed with, like, synth music as well. Hmm. But, um, like, that video of Clowns Full of Hate, which Dave Parrott did, which was out of Austin, he used a lot of the bands that were from that. Um, there, there was a, a record label there called Wax Tracks that was putting out stuff by, like, Ministry, and, um, and a lot of bands, like, that were kind of, I don't know, crossing over punk into, like, this in industrial sound is what it was called. But it's funny how much of an influence that that video had on me as well, getting me into Wax Tracks and, like, their catalog of music as well. So, uh, and it was cool to see that because, like, speaking with Tom and Empire, who I talked to, Tom Williams and Tina Williams and Empire, I talked to Tom um, a couple times a week, but, like, those were those were the bands that he was into at the same time. He's a couple years older than me, but, like, the industrial scene was one of the scenes that he was really into as well. And it was, like, thriving. Like, uh, the, it seemed like the Texas BNX scene was really into that style of music. So it's almost like this geography as well that play, plays into it, too. So. Wow. It's amazing how small the world yeah. <laughs> gets. Whenever you find, like, just through BMX, the world shrinks insane. That's sure. wild. There's a bunch, there are a couple people in the chat going off about Shy Halud. Shy Halud, yeah, they're from South Florida. So, uh, dude, Ronnie Raw Dog said Shy Halud are local bands to me. And then the DFLJ dude said, I got to open for them a couple of times in the late 90s, early 2000s. Gotcha. Yeah. Shy, I, I actually saw Shy Lou play quite a bit. They played, there was a uh, local record store that uh, was really thriving in Tampa between 97 and 99 called 4 3 Chaos. And Shy Lou was, they would come up and play quite a bit. So, yeah. That's Florida really had cool. a really, really rich hardcore scene. And, I mean, it, it still does. I'm just not that connected to the younger scene now. But, you know, when I was, again, in high school and college, the. There was there were a lot of bands here, and there was a lot of shows, and a lot of like connections between all the cities, between Tampa and Orlando, and Miami, and Tallahassee, and Jacksonville. It was pretty cool. That is cool. Uh, we got a reminder in here that says, "Let's not forget Glenn P.P. Mulligan's video called New York Hardcore." Oh, I've never even heard of that. That's cool. Yeah, we need enlightened on that one. Gotcha. Problem I with me is I just <laughs> don't know anything. I. I didn't watch videos growing up riding, and so I just don't know about a lot of this stuff. Sure, sure. And I, I, that's why I do these things, because I like to just learn about these all this different stuff, like what you're talking about with the, the Hoffman and DMC and the music and how just making the connection that that could be how all of this stuff started to, like, the seeds were planted and then started to grow. Sure. Which is, it's such a cool thing to think about. And you're a perfect person to talk about this connection that I feel like I've made, but I don't, I can't, I can't say for sure one way or the other with this one, but BMX felt, feels to me when you look back on it, that it somewhat borrowed from MTV's early style of things that they did. Is that is that a thing? I don't I don't know I don't know what like you mean. editing style and and types of like how I don't know how to explain exactly what I mean the the early days of MTV with music videos and yeah. and the the word style is the only one I can okay come up with like Little Devil TV and like the logo for that one yeah yeah how that's similar to the or based off the MTV logo but sure. I'm sure Derek probably grew up watching MTV there, connection there for sure. Right. So I, I haven't watched a lot enough old videos to know if there's any crossover between early style and MTV music videos and the types of things they did. I'm sure. I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there was between the metal scene, like, you know, and, there was like w within early MTV, there were there was 120 minutes, which was a two hour special that mm -hmm. went on. That was alternative music, and uh, got a lot of bands out of there as well. And I know a lot of those bands ended up like Sonic Youth was one of the bands that was always played in 120 minutes. And it's funny because the Sonic Youth 
song was actually in Brian Castillo's part in Dirty Deeds, which was another Dave Parrick video that had a huge influence on all of us. But um, point of story is there was that connection there and that those videos too on 120 Minutes in particular were super DIY. I mean, that's where you'd see the Dinosaur Jr. videos and, you know, like I said, Sonic Youth. And... The reason why I made that connection ever is because a guy, a, a guy named Mark Pellington came and visited my college when I was in school at the Columbus College of Art and Design. And Mark Pellington, he directed the Jeremy music video for Pearl Jam. Yep. Uh, he directed this random movie, but the Mothman Prophecies, he directed yeah. that movie. But he told his story of how he grew in what he was doing. And in that story started at MTV. He was he got in there as some whatever, you know, mailroom type level thing, I think. And I guess he made something and his boss or something along those lines like hated it. But then a higher up person at MTV saw it and loved it. And like, then they ran with it. And that's part of where the, the early style of the editing type things that I'm talking about. It's, it was been so long that I can't remember how to describe it. Yeah, yeah. But but it was crazy to be like, whoa, like this dude could be responsible for all of these different th things and thematic elements of BMX that it have uh, grown. It's like, whoa, like that's a. I mean, think of uh, I'm I'm think of Spike Jones. I don't know if you yeah, know Jones and what he did. Like that dude was BMXer. That's <laughs> so crazy. Brought, like, we ended up doing these crazy motion pictures that and the bmx elements were definitely a part of that you know so i'm not bmx but just like that idea of creating with bmx as your subject matter or yeah yeah for sure it's interesting i never thought about that that going back to that tv connection and what you just mentioned before like yeah i'm sure a lot of that stuff crossed over and it just becomes it becomes commercial at some point you know it's wild yeah i mean I it feels like no matter what time you're in, the culture of the time spills into BMX at that time too. Sure. But I also feel like part of this whole entire thing overlapping the way it did and why people would be using it in videos is because at its core, early BMX was a tech, like really about being against the grain and sure. you are going out there and I, Robin Morales described it perfectly when he talked about how they used to go out and ride street and kick over garbage cans and stuff just because that's like rebellion and sure. that's what you did. And I feel like some of that exists in the, the punk music culture. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Which, if the two things are the same thing but in different areas of expression, naturally they, they come together and it only makes sense. Sure. There's there's not a lot of people the country music like reference really <laughs> helps. There's not that many people out there who are, you know, mud and <laughs> Sure. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting. Uh somebody the New York hardcore was New York Street BMX video in the nineties that had Robin Morales and quite a few other writers with 25 to life as soundtrack and a few other New York hardcore bands. Okay. Interesting. That's a 1991 Eddie Roman video with Vic Murphy had a hardcore soundtrack with bands like Biohazard. I forget the name of the VHS. Wild. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I mean, obviously I did see a lot. I actually, there was quite a few of Biohazard, quite a few Biohazard songs in those early videos. I'm sure it was probably in He's probably one of the head person right on as well. But uh interesting too that you brought up um that he brought up Robbie with um there was I, honestly I can't remember if it was the first fit video, but they used a band from New Jersey called Iconoclast that I was really, really into, another very obscure punk band from that area. And I remember hearing that and being like, Holy dude, someone knows about this band. This is amazing. <laughs> so even more of a thing that makes the world smaller and yeah, yeah absolutely gives you something to be psyched about now yeah i'm sure you talked to the people involved about it at some point right uh the people involved like the people in the video or 
people who made the video? Have you ever talked to them about that? No, no, actually, I haven't. I mean, it was, it's funny thinking about that. Like, I, I was, I talked to Matt about it a while ago. Um, and then Jeff, you know, I brought that up the other day. He knew there was one song in particular on Don't Quit Your Day Job that really in a home. And he, in the text, he actually brought it up. He knew exactly what song I was talking about. But that's really it. I mean, I've never met Dave Parrott to say, hey, dude, you've really, like, you seriously influenced, like, I mean, you really did. I mean, in that whatever soundtrack, I don't know if he chose it. I don't know if the writers chose it. But at the time, like, he had such a big influence on not just me, but, like, all the, the people I rode with. But it's funny because all those, all those writers ended up getting into bands, not all of them, but a lot of them got into bands as well. Um, a lot of those guys are still listening to the same music that they were then. So there's just that weird influence of, you know, it's just music, but like you said, there's so much more, um, there's so much more piss that, that is included in that music as well, whether it be, you know, you, reminiscence or, or like ideals that you've created out of it, or I don't know. It's like, it was like the soundtrack to our lives, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, punk is the soundtrack of BMX for me and always will be. I mean, again, it's an umbrella. There's a lot of subgenres that come out of that, but it's still like the backdrop to whatever I do. So, right. How do you feel like that's influenced BMX and how you've done things through the years? Um, the DIY aspect for sure. I mean, through work and it, I've been given a lot of leeway and profile with, with how I handle things because profile is, is a machine shop. You know, we, the owner may made and still makes, you know, uh, parts for race cars and then the freestyle department and the, and the promotional aspect of that was just handed to me in 2001. It's like, do something with this. Um, because uh, Jeff Harrington, who I'd filled play, his place moved on. So I had to kind of begin again almost and create something out of it. But since then, you know, when I had taken it over in 2001 was when the La Revs were going on, that Primo was doing it. Mm. And even though um, those were organized contests, they were still super DIY. And then you have the, the FBM contests that were going on at the same time that were super DIY. And that, that ethos of just getting out there and making it happen. Like, you know what, we can't wait for this big contest to happen. We're just going to make it in our own backyard, you know, out of whatever spare wood. And, it, and again, like that coincided with the bands of that era too, like, the interesting thing about Florida was that we, Florida was really violent when I had originally started going to shows and, and a lot of bands wouldn't tour down here because it was incredibly violent. I was, of course, not part of that. I, I was a kid and even if now I wouldn't be a part of that, but so bands didn't really tour down here that much. So when bands did come, um, it was a really big deal for us. We all went to the shows and then there was a point, um, my junior senior of high school where i just started doing shows i just started doing shows in my house <laughs> so my mom actually um had she went to work at night she would clock in at six and we would have we had a band drive down from north carolina at one point drove all day to play my living room <laughs> what? my mom was at work huge huge amount of people in my living room i'm like looking back now i'm like anxiety thinking about this, <laughs> this house today um, and then we would, they would play, things would get wild, we'd clean up, they would leave, my mom would come home after work. How long like did it prob- take for her to get wise to this? Um, it's funny because she never caught on. What? We did a really good job cleaning up. I'm not That's gonna lie. amazing. Uh, I mean, everyone at the show helped me clean up, so it wasn't just me cleaning up. Like, these were like, the punk scene was like, alright, we're coming together, we're gonna make this show happen, um, and we're gonna clean up. So, um, yeah. probably you know, six times. I remember I was telling someone else this story. Maybe he had written it. It was like a written interview or something. And my mom had read it. She's like, I had no clue you did this. I'm like, perfect. Because it makes me feel good that it happened because nothing was destroyed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's like what these movies where kids are doing all these crazy parties and stuff are like hope the kids are hoping for it to happen in the movie, <laughs> but it never does. But for yeah. you, it like, leg- it worked out. And that's crazy. Sure, yeah, it was crazy. I mean, of course, I didn't allow like anyone to drink or anything else, so it wasn't getting, wasn't getting too wild. But you know, just wild, like we were in the bands that were coming down to play. So right, fun experience. That is incredible. Um, so you described things as violent. What do you mean by that? Um, we the state of Florida. I mean. Unfortunately, that is, well, that's that's kind of a multi-tiered question, to be honest with you, Brad. Like, Violet, we had a really, really serious issue with with neo-Nazi skinheads oh. in Florida. 
So that contributed a lot to um, they they would and I don't know if this is the right word, but they you know were, were they had basically infiltrated the punk scene and and they would they would basically make it so difficult for bands to come down. Who knows why? I mean, why, yeah, why would you do? I mean, anyways, that's all. That's a whole other yeah yeah totally different. <laughs> but like, um, so that was one of the reasons that a lot of bands didn't tour down here because that kind of fomented the violence at these shows. And, um, and then there was a time when things got violent. So we just started doing, started doing our own shows just to make it not, not just me, but like all of the, I mean, the scene that I was a part of, we were, a lot of the people started their own venues. Uh, a lot of people were doing house shows. Um, a lot of people were like bands would have rental spaces that would practice out of and we would just have shows in the practice spaces so we could avoid you know the masses showing up to cause problems so uh yeah so mainly that was the major issue that was going on wow so, man i can't imagine having to like keep something on the down low so that other people don't come in and ruin it for no reason yeah it was crazy and, and it and it got it got violent i mean there was a lot of really awful stuff that i had seen um th there was fortunately there was actually a a huge um like anti-racist movement i mean there still is very much so here now but like then it was it was it was this anti-racist anti-racist movement within the punk scene that would really, really push back. And I have never been an aggressive or violent person, but I mean, it was it got really, really wild. I mean, it pushed, it pushed the neo-Nazis away for sure, but it was wow. insane to watch it physically happen for sure. So how long of a period of time did it take for that to, uh, a while, because I mean, that was going on in the eighties well before I got involved. Um, it got really, really bad in the early nineties, like really, really bad it, it died off probably late 90s was when kind of things got pushed away and then, you know wow so everyone that was crazy so you started right did you say you started writing in 91 started writing 89 89 and so when did you get involved with the the hardcore punk scene um so i in 89 i met um the my skater buds probably the next year in 1990 okay so bmx came first yeah, BMX came first, then punks. Well, I mean, I listened to I listened to metal. I mean, there are definitely roots. There's metal roots in the in the punk and hardcore scene for sure. So, the music side of things was already there. I, I was um, I was really into like specific metal bands, uh, like thrash metal bands. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also really into reggae at the time, and it, it, interesting too because it was definitely a political aspect within the reggae scene that I really connected to as well. Um, and then that you know kind of branched into punk and post-punk but i mean all of that music is really interconnected somehow as well Man. so music definitely did come first just not punk and then bmx and then immediately punk after bmx so you know what's interesting too is that i just talked yesterday with my girlfriend about that video that you sent me about yeah. under oath and how yeah. the band you were in was mentioned in there so let's take it even a step further so punk and hardcore being intertwined with BMX, then the the under oath type genre of music also was huge in BMX, mm -hmm. and it was directly influenced by punk and hardcore. Yeah, under post hardcore, well, literally. That's the yeah, name under of the genre. Was the hardcore band. So yeah, that's so crazy to make all of these connections. And literally, that's why I wanted to talk to you about this because it's yeah. just such a cool thing to bring all of these things together with. It's also weird that a lot of those dudes live in my neighborhood. <laughs> really, the Underoath guys? <laughs> yeah, the Underoath guys. That's a crazy. Of, yeah, they live. I live in this area called Seminole Heights, and a couple of those guys are still in this area. So it's pretty funny. That's. I mean, that's cool. Yeah. Man, so wild. So, did you do? Do you have anything in your notes? Because I really left this open ended because I know you are so much more involved with this, and I just wanted to ask the question. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. I mean, one of the things, you know, going back to um, when we talked about that soundtrack idea, I was thinking about that today as well. And, and it's interesting because not only was it metaphorically the soundtrack mm -hmm. to writing for us, but it was it was literally the soundtrack. And what I mean by that is that we would 
with early BMX videos on VHS, we would actually record the soundtracks of those videos to cassette tapes mm -hmm. and actually listen to the video, the soundtrack of the video while we were riding. Yeah. So I remember there were certain times when we would be learning, we would try to learn tricks that we would see in these videos, but it would have to coincide <laughs> with the music that was taking place during that section with who was pulling that trick. Whoa. <laughs> it was ridiculous, yeah. Do you have any memories of landing the trick when someone else was landing the trick in the video? I, I don't want to sound weird saying this, but I, I was able to when I was young. I don't, I can't do them anymore. I've done them and honestly, I haven't done one in probably two decades, but I used to do a lot of nothings. Mm -hmm. um, not, it wasn't necessarily coinciding with this. It was to the song Blueprint by Fagazi, and it was on, um, I can't remember if it was right on or head first, but um, the beginning of that song is when Hoffman's part starts. And even though I could never ride like, I, I didn't ride quarter pipes. We, we didn't have quarter pipes. We had dirt jumps. So we, we connected with this dude named Chad Harrington who had a section who was dirt jumper. But uh, we were trying to learn all his tricks. So I remember pulling one of my first nothings while I was listening to that Fagazi song Blueprint that Hoffman had written to. Whoa. On my walk. <laughs> Whoa. That's so. crazy. And I don't think I've actually told him that. I probably next time I see him around, I'll have to, uh, have to tell him that story. It's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, I, that's just cool. I I quit listening to music when I ride a long time ago. Yeah. So I never. But sometimes Diary of a Madman comes on at Rays. Yeah. And and we're at Rays, so it's like, oh, you can't. You're not gonna do hard. There's almost nothing that Van Homan did in that video that you could replicate at Rays. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, I'm always like, it's, whatever anybody does right now is for Van Hoen, so you gotta do yeah. something gnarly. Yeah, it's funny. Man. So, yeah, that, that soundtrack idea, though, like I said, really, you know, I never actually thought of it that way, but that was that was really cool. Uh, another, like, interesting thing, too, and this is just a personal note, could be of interest, may not, may not be, but, like, with that music, too, so us hearing the music in those videos we we didn't so you know you have the, the the credits of that video and you'd see what band it was and you could never really tell what albums those songs were off of so we would actually pedal up to the record store we had a really it was actually called the alternative record store and we would pedal up there me and the crew that i rode with and we would we would try to find the names of so like say jawbreaker for instance there was a jawbreaker song on one of the hawkman videos and um, was it John? It might have been in uh, in Dirty Deeds, actually. Now that I think about it, but we would we would flip through the vinyl and try to find that band, and we basically bought everything we could <laughs> from that band to find that song. Wow! So you know, we were all kids in high school. None of us had jobs. Uh, I had like a my grandmother spoiled me, who was across the street from me. She gave me a couple of dollars every week for an allowance. So I would just save it up and buy vinyl. Because you could buy a seven inch uh, album for three dollars. So um. And you'd have a one in four chance of finding that song because it's on a little seven inch record. So we would all, the group of, of writers I would ride with, we'd all buy different records of that band and then have them combined so we could have the complete catalog of that band to find that one song that we were trying to. Oh my <laughs> god! <laughs> so people, <laughs> kids have no idea how how good they got it. Where all they gotta yeah. do is go in the description, boom, there it is. 100%. But I mean, it was also fun. It was part of the chase. And it was also like a reason for us to be on bikes. I mean, that's all, you know, outside of BMX for us too. It was our, it was our commute. Like we, none of us had cars. We'd pedal mm -hmm. everywhere. We'd pedal 10 miles down the road to go downtown. We'd pedal to shows. We'd, um, yeah, it was awesome. So like, it just gave us an excuse to go pedal to the record store too. So, but, uh, yeah, I was thinking about that today. I'm like, man, I can't believe how much money we spent on vinyl. <laughs> and, uh, when, when I, um, my house was actually destroyed in 2003 during Hurricane Ivan. Actually, seven story of concrete fell on our house and uh, and smashed. I mean, it literally fell straight across our house and smashed it to the ground. But um, I'm, I really enjoy reading, and I have a large book collection that I can't get rid of. I'm not a hoarder by any means, but I just love the look of books. Mm -hmm. So, but the other thing is is vinyl for me and, and music. It's 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 a catalog of music. Is is literature to me? It's just musical literature you know so yeah. had a huge vinyl collection most of it was smashed during that hurricane so just completely ruined by all the water and uh and debris that had come into that house 
that had come into the house, but uh, I was really bummed because I lost a lot of that vinyl. And even though, like, I don't listen to vinyl much anymore, there's still, like, that aspect of, like, that connection to me of oh, uh, yeah. that to me through that stuff that I had bought when I was a kid because it had a connect direct connection to BMX. So, um, yeah, so that was, that was a wild, wild thing that we did as kids. There, there was one more thing that I wanted to mention as well, like, in Florida. Um, there was a contest. It's funny because Rick Thorne had posted... A, re- a couple of recent clips from the BS contest uh, in Daytona, which was in 1993. I was in the 10th grade and we went to me and the same crew went to that contest. Um, we got there really early in the morning because we didn't drive. Our parents took us and we thought Daytona was an eight hour drive. It's only two. <laughs> so we left at like two in the morning and got there <laughs> at like four <laughs> and hung out in the parking lot until, you know, stuff started getting rolling. And uh, I remember um, a really good friend, Aaron Banky, who uh, who lives up in West Virginia now. He's he's originally from Port St. Lucie, but lived in Orlando for years. He, I, I have always loved flat. I've never, I, I wrote it originally when I started writing, but I just, I, I love flat so much. I love watching it. I love, I love every aspect of it. But I remember sitting out front and watching the flat contest. And my buddy was not my buddy at the time. Aaron Banky was riding to a shelter writing to sorry he had a shelter long sleeve t-shirt on which was a band that i absolutely loved in that era I'm like dude who is this dude he's amazing at riding bikes he looks rad he's riding with the shirt on what's going on and then he rode to this band four walls falling which i was also really into and literally i was like oh yeah i don't even have to describe it i was like starstruck I'm like, no, don't know who this dude is i just want to like i need to know this guy so I, I went up and introduced myself, and it's funny because we were texting today as well. Um, nothing to do with this interview, but it's so mm-hmm. funny. That, that little incident in 1993, again, that connection of BMX and music has lasted however, I mean, what's the math on that? Whatever the math is on that now, you know, 30 whatever years. Um, and still a super close friend of mine, and we still have that kind of bond that will never be, I don't know, we have that bond of those two things connected. That was at this random spot in Daytona. So it's, wild. it's amazing. It's, yeah. I mean, I can't think of any other way to describe it. it yeah. It's, it was funny. I was more into, like, even though, like, I was enamored with his writing, I was way more into why he chose that Four Walls Falling song. I was like, damn, dude. <laughs> that, that song, that's so, and it was, it's an obscure band, too. I'm like, what? Dude, that's so amazing. So that's super rad. I, I wonder. Because things are so radically different in BMX today for like the youth, the kids, I wonder if that's kind of those connections still exist. I'm sure with Instagram, you you can use a music in every single post. So, sure. I'm, I mean, if you if you ask someone that question or multiple people that question, get an answer for real. I'd love to know the answer to that. I'm sure there is. I just know want to know what it is. I mean, I'm turning. I'm turning 45 this year, so it's crazy. Like, even though I ride, I mean, there's two younger riders that I ride with every Wednesday at the park who are 11 and 12, and it's so funny, like, communicating with them because we do BMX is what we have in common. Mm-hmm. So, you know, constantly, and the questions that come up are always BMX related, but I have to step back sometimes. I'm like, man, this is so crazy. <laughs> I'm like riding. Well, when you think about what it dudes. is, <laughs> like, at its base level, what it is is a 44 year old dude hanging out yeah. with kids. Like it's it, it's weird to other people if you're not thinking about the context of it, but for us, it's just totally normal. Yeah, hundred percent. It's totally. crazy, and BMX being that connection is rad. I I don't know how to learn if that is the case today, other than to broadcast it somewhere like this, and like if you're you're 15 and you're listening to whatever music is popular right now and you're seeing someone else using a song from some obscure artist and you talk to them about it like let me know i don't know how else to find that really really curious to know the answer like if there's that connection please relay that i feel like it almost has to be yeah sure at at that rate i mean it's got to be almost the exact same thing if some kid in california uses obscure artist from who knows texas nebraska wherever and then someone in florida sees that clip doesn't know that person but knows that artist i i feel like you'd almost have to it it just naturally feels like it would happen sure sure 
Absolutely. Man, it's crazy the things that bring people together. Yeah. I love it. I really do. Man, I really... I got confused for a second earlier. I was really hoping we'd be able to hear the Danny Law's watermelon story. <laughs> but it was you who asked Alex to tell it, not you telling it. Oh, I got to get him on somehow I would, to tell I that story. Yeah. He's inner, like, I, I was just, we arrived the other day. Alex is unfortunately hurt right now. We went through that uh, bull jam right before Swamp Tested Spot. And he actually hurt his knee, unfortunately. But Damn. um, he's staying busy. I mean, you know, him with his welding job. He's always yeah, oh, I so see him so posting. Big. But um, he, yeah, dude, he is the he is the best, one of the best storytellers I've ever met, and amazing. So I'm glad he <laughs> that story with you. <laughs> it's amazing you remember the dude's name too. Dude, how can you not? Danny Law is the best dude ever. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, <sighs> well, what's BM, How's BMX life for you right now? Since I feel like we well, actually, gone... honestly, this is this is this is probably the most. It's the best that Tampa scene has been. Tampa, I should say Tampa Bay. Uh, in my opinion, I mean, this is just my opinion, but there's um, there's so many people to ride with. There's so many people riding bikes. There's so much stuff to ride. Uh, there's so many cool events going on in the state with what you know Trey has been doing. Yeah. Um, and Dave Brummo with the FL series. It's been on hiatus for for two years because of COVID, but he, he's going to start it up again this coming year. So there's a lot of really cool things going on. I think a lot of pride in the state. Um, I always feel like we've been kind of stuck down here away from everyone else. So it's, it's cool to see. Um, it's just cool to see awesome things going on down here. And like, you know, going back to that punk connection as well, the state of Florida within the BMX scene, so many people here know each other. And it's amazing because of how big the state is. I mean, if you go from Pensacola to Key West, it's a 16 hour drive, Whoa, which is insane to think about, but it's funny, the connection that we, that we all have with riders in Pensacola, which are it's nine hours from here, or my buddies in Jacksonville, it's four and a half hours from here, or my buddy AJ, who lives in Key West, it's eight hours from here. I'm going to see him next week, actually, I'm going to Key West, but it's, it's interesting. Like there's, there's still, even though the state is so big, there's still so much of a connection here because I don't think people take for granted what we have down here. Um, not that, I mean, I know I shouldn't generalize and say that, but, um, being historically that we've been given very little, um, we make a lot out of very little and it kind of makes me really proud of what we have going on down here. So yeah, yeah well, there's... It's, it's great. I love Florida. I love riding down here. Um, and it's been awesome. I have never, I don't think I've ever been this motivated in my life that's, within BMX. It's great. That's so. rad. There's a lot of good companies with good people in Florida mm -hmm. too. I mean, which sure with shadow over there near Orlando profile over there and SCG shoes too. And probably more that I don't know about or missing, but there's that. And I've noticed too, with those FL series, there's people who aren't from Florida that are going to Florida and competing in those, Absolutely. which is crazy. And then obviously Trey Jones and swamp fest are bringing thousands of people from everywhere. Yeah. And I'm also really stoked on Trey's love for Florida as well. Like, he loves the state a lot. It's really, really awesome. Really awesome. So, exactly. It's great. So. There he is right there in all his glory, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm I'm stoked for everything going on down there. And just, I'll be back for Swamp Fest. Cool. Can't, can't miss it. A couple, uh, get a couple ramp sessions in. There's more ramps to uh, come ride now, which is amazing. So, and more DIY spots. It's funny because the full circle here too, the, the guy, um, did you ride turtle ditch by chance? That cement DIY spot that I know down? what it is, but I didn't ride it. Okay. So one of the dudes, one of the skaters that actually had the biggest influence on me through the punk scene is the dude that built all that DIY stuff. Whoa. Name Scott. Um, one of my oldest friends, he's always been an advocate for BMX. Um, he's never ridden BMX. He's always skated, um, but he's always been a huge advocate for BMX. And his whole whole idea with building DIY in Tampa Bay is that he wants everyone to ride it. He's building it for everyone to ride it, which That's is awesome. incredible. He actually just built a new spot over the weekend, like wow. on the wall. It's amazing. A, a beautiful Jersey Barrier spot literally overlooking Tampa Bay. It's so awesome. Sounds so, like I kind of want to ride that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, come on down. I'm sure you'd be stoked to see you ride it. Um, real quick here. 
I have a question I gotta answer. LSB, I'm from Ohio, not PA. And uh, somebody asked, what song would you pick for your dream BMX part? Do you have one? Oh, gosh. Ooh. Have you already used it? Um, I've used a couple from the, my most favorite band for sure. But um, my my favorite band of all time is this band called Hoover. And they are from DC. And there is a band or there is a song on there that is really meaningful to me called Cuts Like Drugs. And it would be that song, but I don't think I can edit a video part to it because it's it's just it, it's one of those songs that's just not justifiable within it just can't be you can't get it justice. Yeah, <laughs> so, totally. I mean I get it. Yeah. That's how I feel about Pantera with BMX. Gotcha. I feel like it has to be a very specific type of riding in person for it to even halfway work sure sure absolutely i would i would love to use a pantera song one day but i just <laughs> i know with the way i ride i'm kicking a freaking saran wrap off a tree to like pantera going nuts it just doesn't work it's funny with editing too like you know i'm working on a couple of local projects here for a lot of my a lot of the, uh, the writers in the scene and it's it's so interesting trying to figure out a song going back to the musical aspect of this because the, the crew that arrived with is so diverse and, and no one listens to the same music. So it's interesting trying to choose a song because I mean, punk is just a genre of music that I listen to. I listen to, well, I actually, a lot of my favorite music isn't actually even punk. Um, but it's funny trying to choose a song that, that will represent a group of, of folks that, mm -hmm. that are so diverse. So that's a really good question. It would be that song, but it's not possible. Um, and it's looking at these two edits I'm doing right now. I have no idea what I'm editing these two songs to. That's... Like I'm big into percussion, so it's going to have to be something um, that's really percussion based, meaning drums. But uh, I won't know until I get there. So it's being somebody who edits real edit type videos like that a lot. It is the single most difficult part, aside from whatever the most mind block hard trick in the video might be sure absolutely it is crazy um crazy how difficult that can be damn it i had another good question there and i lost it again but it's it's music and videos go hand in hand together like that and they always will and it's kind of like a sacred thing in bmx i feel almost yeah 100 percent. you know it was really shocking to see i remember seeing my first edit i don't know what it was i mean it was i don't know 10 12 years ago but seeing an edit not edited to music like an actual i mean i know that's a lot more popular now with with a lot of the youtube um stuff that's going on where it's more like interview and narrative type stuff but like just a a a, a video part that is solely BMX riding with no music. It, it was amazing. I remember seeing it and being like, damn, this is, this is actually amazing that there's no, like, the sound of the bike is the music. Yeah. And oh, it's yeah. Phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's its own music in itself. But, um, I mean, that's only going to, for me aesthetically, like, I'm going to have to see that in a mix of 10 other videos to really appreciate it. I mean, I really like the musical aspect of that, but seeing that stick out, I was like, damn, like, the bike is the instrument in this, and it's incredible. Right. So, I actually am about to, as soon as I get it edited, I'm, I'm doing something as the, it's not going to be a song to this video edit that I'm working on. I don't think anyone's ever done what I'm going to do before, and I really hope it works. If it doesn't, no one's ever going to see it, but <laughs> I have an idea, and I just, I'm excited for it. And I remember what I was going to say. I've been telling people lately, you are the most cultured person that I know. Me? Yes, you. Really? Wow, that's humbling. Hanging, well, just hanging out with you in Florida and hearing you talk about all these different places in the world and you know all about their food and all of these different things about these places and then like those little, the little grasshopper guy who came over and you're like oh you say the name of it <laughs> yeah, you just know exactly what it is it's like what, what? <laughs> it's just cool and and then i just through talking about this stuff i it's cool it's culture it's awesome i love learning about it yeah that being said though we're at an hour in i feel like have we covered the topic well i feel like we have yeah, i thought we did i mean there, you can go on a lot of a lot of the interstices of this but i mean it's i mean i covered everything that that i thought was 
you know, kind of the shell of, of what we, you know, plan to discuss. Uh, I am really, truly interested in that question that you asked. I mean, I'd love to see, I would love to hear what the answer is now um, for, for someone who's a younger rider that's gotten into BMX, if there's a connection to something out there that is, whether it be music or something else, that there's kind of the tie that binds with, with people um, or with riders. But yeah, I think that was, I, I appreciate you inviting me on. Absolutely. Was and it was cool to like create a framework of this as well. Like as I'm looking at my notes, because I didn't, I never thought about this stuff. It's just been a part of what I've done in my life. And I'm like, ah, this is how it happened. And I'm like, actually, there's kind of an interesting framework that goes along with this. So again, thank you for having me. Yeah, dude, it's, it's, it's a cool thing to have this thought and question in your mind and then find the right person to ask and talk to about it. And then you expand it into something that you never would have ever imagined. And I never would have thought any other way in my life about the connection between videos and the music in them and their influence on BMX mm -hmm. and its influence on, we didn't even touch the, the BMX influence on the punk hardcore scene. Yeah. That is a right. totally another thing that I never even thought about. It's crazy. Yeah. It really I mean, is. Dig do as a side note, like Dig as an entity. Will Smith, the the the, the owner of Dig, yeah, is he is from that scene as well. He is from the punk scene, like punk and and I would love to hear an interview with Will actually to hear. I mean, I've asked him about this before, but um, he is the epitome of that. I mean, Dig BMX started as a punk BMX magazine. I mean, it was that was the. I should have actually brought that up right out of the gate but like dig is the epitome of that interesting so, i mean hey yeah. there's no reason we gotta end this let's hear about it yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean it would it would have to come from will i mean I've, i i was really really honored uh, my wife and i got to stay with him when we were in scotland back in 2010 and we get to spend the night and and discuss the creation of dig and like his back history but will was a super interesting dude and like he was in it was in Northern Ireland when the troubles were going on. So there's a lot of violence. I mean, w he and I were talking about the violence that we experienced, you know, within the punk scenes growing up. But I mean, his violence was like violent, like explosions, bombs, guns. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a whole, I mean, that's a, that's a crazy, it's a really intense time in world history and in Irish history, but uh, he would have to go into detail on that. I can't justify that for him. It's just too wild. So, yeah. well, will, if for some reason you hear about this or you hear this or you listen to this, I am down. I don't have the same information that Matt has. So maybe <laughs> if it happens, we could get you both in here. And I would, this, I would love well, this could just well. be the avenue that it happens through. That's kind of why I do these types of things. Cool. Just because I, I, I think it'd be cool to provide that the avenue for something like that to happen. But also he's, I don't know if he'd want to put something about himself on Dig, but there's Dig. He could do it on Dig, too. Sure. The idea sure. is there. Um, I, I just made a connection, too, that I think is kind of funny. I don't know. I guess it's not funny. But you talk about the violence and stuff, and then you look at BMX and Swamp Fest and explosions and how we're just hanging out and people are throwing fireworks into the crowd for fun. <laughs> but then you look back at something like that, and there's like actual violence against people sure, happening. Sure. I mean, but again, like the the idea of Swamp Fest too is like reveling in, and there's just chaotic stuff going on. I mean, that that is also a a good punk show as well. Like there is revelry, no one's getting hurt, stuff's getting wild. But like, but then there's the violent aspect where people are physically trying to hurt other people. Like that obviously isn't the you know the case at one of these contests. But, yeah. But uh, but I I know I know what you mean. So wild. Yeah. Well, Matt, I appreciate you coming on here. and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. I feel like maybe it was a nice break to talk about something aside from Profile. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Profile is amazing. I think talking about these types of things are cool, too. Cool. I appreciate it. And I hope I answered some of the questions as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, I could have gone off on, a, on plenty of tangents, but, um, you know, it's kind of separating the subjective from the objective and it's i mean i can tell you subjective personal stories forever but i think the framework is what we really want to talk about which is the objective idea of of these two concepts kind of coinciding so which they do very much as we figured out so 
Absolutely. So if anybody is interested in seeing Matt's riding or anything else he posts about on Instagram, the most cultured guy in BMX, also the most busy guy in BMX. How many of these titles are you going to get? Uh, where where do they find you on Instagram? And I'm on Instagram at, at, and it's Matt, and then underscore C-O-P-L-O-N. It's my last name, Matt Copeland. There it is. Do you you write too, don't you? I do, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, I mean, I, 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 I did. I mean, I do, but it, I haven't written in a while because I've actually decided to just spend a lot more time reading. I, I just feel like there's mm-hmm. so much going on that I need to educate myself on. But yeah, I have I have written quite a bit and, and I've put out uh, written projects before, yes. So. so is that the kind of thing that someone could find, like or you would talk about on Instagram, the fact that it happened in the future? Um, wait, what was the question? Sorry. Is that the kind of thing that you'd like post about on Instagram in the future? I'm just seeing if we should say where they could find that too. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I have published, self-published a couple books. If you're interested in reading any nonfiction, you know, a lot wow. of it is MX related and punk related. Actually, the first book I had done, which was called Class of the Whatever, it's 40 short nonfiction stories, but I mean, it's literally split. Half of it is punk and half of it's BMX, which is funny because now I think about it, I could have brought that up as well <laughs> because I was trying to write all these stories down and they ended up going into print. But those, yes, you can, if you're interested in any of, those, any of that material, I still have copies if you'd like one. So There it is. Hit them yeah, up yeah. on Instagram, check it yeah. out, and uh, thank you. This was cool. Yeah. This was really cool. Cool. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. And I'll, uh, I'll get a hold of you in April and we'll, we'll hang out. All right, sounds good. We'll be here, and like I said, there's plenty of uh, new new uh, stuff to ride, so please come down. Yeah, I'm going to make more of a trip out of it for Swamp Fest. Cool. Cool, man. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate Thank you it. again, and uh, we'll talk eventually soon, I'm sure. Awesome, Brad. See you, bud. Bye. Later. Boom. There it is, everybody. Oh, get out of here. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, thank you again to Matt. We'll be here tomorrow with another video. So if you're watching this and you're here or you haven't yet, consider to subscribe and uh, definitely check Matt out online. Rad dude. Thanks. Good night.